Do you listen to jazz too? I think we all should. In my estimation, jazz and rock and roll are the two undisputed kings of 20th century music. They often lead parallel lives, but I live for those moments when they overlap, from Miles Davis to Steely Dan. Well, there's another one I have for you, a 14-minute epic song that I think should be in every rock and roll fan's collection. Yes! Comes from the Duke. Not that Duke, this Duke. And I'm gonna explain now why this song that features a six and a half minute sax solo is so rock and roll to me right now on Robert's Record Corner. I'm Robert. Let's start with a metaphor. In 1931, Charlie Chaplin released a silent film in the age of talkies called City Lights. And here we have a story where the tramp is misunderstood by a blind woman to be a millionaire. He's anything but. But she overhears someone nearby getting into a chauffeured car and driving away. In the end of the film, she gains her sight after an operation and sees the tramp for the first time. And their reaction of one another, her seeing who this figure really is, and he pensively seeing how she'll react to it, is one of the greatest, most touching, and sweetest moments in cinematic history. And audiences needed that. It was 1931, it was the peak of the depression. And people saw this movie as a, a nostalgic connection to more flourishing times. And they stood in their seats and gave standing ovations in cinema houses to seeing the tramp finally win. City Lights is as good as it gets. Duke Ellington was born in 1899 in Washington, D.C., and by the 1930s, he was already a legendary composer and band leader for big band jazz. He was in Harlem, set up in the Cotton Club, and playing for Lindy Hop or Jitterbug dancers, and filling the 1930s with hits, perfectly crafted to fill the three minutes of each side of a 78 RPM record. People started calling him the Hot Bach. Writer Ralph Ellison likened him to Hemingway for his tone parallels that perfectly captured human emotion. Duke simply said, I just watch people and observe life and write about them. But by the 1950s, Big Band was on the way out. You ain't nothing but In 1956, when Elvis made his debut in Ed Sullivan to play Hound Dog, Duke was in a bit of a slump. So he started building back up the big band. For a drummer, he got Sam Woodward from New Jersey. To play bass, Jimmy Wood, who'd played with Charlie Parker and Billie Holiday. And most importantly, he lured back his longtime collaborator, Billy Strayhorn, the openly gay member of the band who had composed songs like Take the A-Train. Now, they just needed a place to play. In 1954, the little town of Newport, Rhode Island, put up its hand to be the site of the first annual jazz festival in the USA. And it's still going. It's a place where people go with fancy outfits and fantastic hats. They dance. Sometimes they eat ice cream. And over the years, it's seen some truly iconic moments. This is the place in 1963 where Bob Dylan had his coming out as a voice of a generation folk singer. I let you be in my dream if I can be in yours. I said that. Two years before he angered everyone by plugging in his electric guitar. How does it feel? In 1958, the festival first expanded to rock and roll and blues with performances by Muddy Waters Got my mojo and Chuck Berry, along with Louis Armstrong, Dinah Washington, and a mesmerizing set by Anita O'Day. But the legend was truly born before that, in 1956. Organizers were planning a live album, and they asked Duke Ellington if he could whip up something new. And when Duke and the band arrived on July 7th, Duke was initially disappointed to find out that they were closing the set, which meant going on stage just before midnight. And initially, the audience, maybe tired from a summer day, was a little lukewarm to the reaction. Then, 30 or 40 minutes into his set, Duke introduced 
something that he had first recorded back in 1937. What follows is a 14-minute epic that I think should be in every rock fan's collection. Diminuendo and Crescendo in Blue, the last song on this album, Ellington at Newport. Duke himself would later say this is the night that he was reborn. Now the song is essentially a mashup of three parts. Diminuendo in Blue, which is two minute 41 second song from 37. An interval followed with Diminuendo's B-side, Crescendo in Blue from 37. It begins with Duke playing piano chords and it erupts into this interplay and call and response between trumpets and trombones and saxophones and clarinets. It winds up after three minutes and 49 seconds back into the piano. And then they go to the second part. Now for years, Duke had been wanting to merge these two B-sides of the same song into one long form musical piece. And he had experimented with different ways to do segues. But by 56, he'd been handing the keys over to a guy named Paul Gonzalez, the saxophone player. And as soon as this begins, the big band steps out. This is the year of rock and roll coming out. Elvis is about to go on Ed Sullivan. It's just drums, bass, a little piano, and saxophone. Paul Gonzalez steps up in a suit, eyes closed, and begins to solo. Feverishly continuing his solo, going forward and forward, and the energy picks up. Soon you hear someone yelling. Banging the side of the stage, that's Joe Jones, a drummer from another band, yelling, dig in, Paul. The crowd's getting louder and louder. You can hear this as it goes. Let's stop for a second. When you think about solos and rock and roll, what are the longest solos that you would ever imagine to hear on rock radio? I looked up a few. The iconic climactic end to Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin from 71. How long do you think that solo is? 49 seconds. Or Eruption, the instrumental by Eddie Van Halen on Van Halen's first album, one minute, 42 seconds. How about the dueling guitars that end Hotel California? Two minutes and 12 seconds, or Freebird, the most requested song in the history of rock and roll, ending with guitar solo after solo after solo. is four minutes and 24 seconds. Paul Gonzalez, one man playing into a saxophone, six minutes and 21 seconds. Now, by the end of the solo, the crowd was completely transformed. By all accounts, this is a response to the music and also one fan. Elaine Anderson, platinum blonde in a dark brown cocktail dress, got up and started dancing. She's a really interesting person. She grew up in Boston. She had moved to Hollywood to become a Hollywood star and by her own admission made three terrible movies. It seems like she was an extra. This is her as a secretary in a night of adventure. But she was there in 1956. And during the song, she was so overpowered by the music, by Paul Gonzalez's solo, by Joe Jones pounding on the side of the stage, the music coming from that stage after midnight now, that she got up, flailing arms, throwing her head back, twisting and turning and dancing and getting the crowd. Soon you started seeing people dance all the way through the crowd of 7,000 spectators and everyone pressing up against the stage. So important this was considered for the power of this performance that they covered it in the newspaper the next day and Duke Ellington would later meet her in Los Angeles and when she said, I don't even have a record player, got her one. This sax solo is the reason why this album and this moment is so famous. But I think the best is to come, Crescendo in Blue. After the six and a half minute solo, Paul Gonzalez collapses back onto the bandstand and the big band is back. You hear the trombones and the trumpets and the saxophones and the clarinets. The audience is pressed up against the stage. They're ready. They're pouncing on every moment. Remember Ellison said the Duke is able to capture human emotion. I think this emotion is joy of life. Oh. 
Elvis is about to be on Ed Sullivan and change everything, and it's like Duke knows this. He's 56 and 56. People think he's an old timer, past his, past his prime. And he's going, well, you want rock and roll? I'm gonna give you rock and roll. He's saying that we're not done yet. He's saying that sometimes you need a silent film in the era of talkies to ground us. The energy is fantastic. One jazz critic said that the best song on the album is Jeep Blues, a perfect example of big band, and that this is something only to listen to in passing because Paul Gonzalez is only a moderately talented saxophone player. Well, listen to this. Compare the reaction to Paul Gonzalez before they played this song. An interval by Paul Gonzalez. And here's how they sounded after. Paul Gonzalez! Paul Gonzalez! Sounds like someone needs to listen to more rock and roll. I think this song is absolutely rock and roll, and I think this album should be in everyone's record collection. I mean, this is a bad copy, but the, it sounds fantastic. I'm gonna, every now and then, I'm gonna share jazz songs and albums that I think cross over to rock and roll well. Do you have favorites? Let me know in comments. Please like and subscribe, and thanks for watching Robert's Record Corner.